Welcome back to Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. NBA playoffs last night continuing with, uh, I guess, uh, really the first series that we got an eye-opener with Oklahoma City winning last night. Chris Mannix is the host of the Chris Mannix Show weekday afternoons on NBC Sports Radio and the NBC Sports Radio app. And, Chris, we had a wild ending, very helter-skelterish last night in San Antonio in the end, I went to bed after they tried to figure it all out. I know the game ended, uh, but what is your take now that the dust has settled on the way that game ended last night? Well, there were at least three violations on that <laughs> final inbounds play, beginning beginning with Manu Ginobili stepping on the end line, continuing with Dion Waiters throwing an elbow while he was trying to inbound the ball, and finishing with Waiters jumping up in the air to make that pass, which is against league rules and should have resulted in a turnover uh, as well. So that was, uh, that was an inexplicable amount, number of blown calls from a referee who was staring right at the play unfold no more than five, six feet uh, away from him. So I, I just don't understand what Mark Davis, the referee, was looking at uh, in that moment as each violation you know, mounted, uh, you know, piled up. Uh, ultimately, though, at the end of the day, you know, San Antonio got what they wanted. They got the ball back. Yeah. They got it in transition, and they blew that opportunity. So as much as we lament what happened in that moment on that inbounds, I'm not sure that San Antonio would trade you know, getting the ball back uh, at half court with the transition opportunity that they ultimately got. Yeah, you know, that was – you're right. The Spurs end up with the ball back and just had a really sloppy transition there, and it just uh, seemed like they were very out of, you know, out of sync, out of what you – out of character – for the Spurs, they looked like they were really didn't weren't sure of what to do when they got that ball there. But Chris, the Thunder, even that series now with that ninety eight ninety seven win, they lost by thirty two points, and it's only the second loss at home this season. How much of an eye opener was that? Do we have the makings of a very long series now? I think we do, and you know it was good to see the Thunder show up, show some desperation, show some effort after getting blown out. In game one, if they had lost game two, the series was over. There was no way they were going to beat San Antonio in four of the next five, uh, not even with you know three of those games uh, on their home floor. They needed that win badly, and they really showed up. And, and look, it's no, it's no surprise that, that Oklahoma City can beat San Antonio. They've done it in the past. Mm-hmm. They beat them in a series in 2012. They played them life and death in 2014. They match up pretty well uh, with the Spurs when they're on their game. They just have to come with the same kind of energy because – you know, San Antonio, they never lack effort. And if you show up with, with a half effort or three-quarters effort against the Spurs, you're going to lose. They've got to make sure that effort from Game 2 carries over into Game 3. Chris Maddox, NBC Sports, with us. An 18-point lead last night disappeared in the fourth cl- quarter, but the Cavaliers closed out on a 17-5 to run. They win 104-93. LeBron James, 25 points, his 120th career playoff win. That passes Michael Jordan. But do the Hawks have any shot in this series and do the Cavaliers look like they are finally a well-oiled machine yeah I don't like the Hawks chances here um you know look they got beat up by the Cavs in the regular season it's still large the same team that got swept by Cleveland in the postseason last year uh, I thought last night was their best chance to win the Cavs had about a week off the the Hawks you'd expect to be a little sharper coming off that series uh with Boston but now that Cleveland got that win I'm not sure that the Hawks can frankly win a game uh, in this series I think Cleveland is focused I think they're motivated yeah I think they're playing their best basketball of the season which is what we saw from this team uh, last year I still have have some doubts about what the Cavs are going to look like uh, in the finals depending on who they play but as far as a, a second round ser- series against the Hawks uh, I'm not sure I see the Hawks beating them NBA playoffs tomorrow night it is Cavs and Hawks on 97.3 ESPN Warriors Chris look to go up 2-0 tonight no Steph Curry but they're 4-0 at home without him there, and, you know, obviously they caught a little bit of a break not facing the Clippers. Do the Blazers have a shot in this one with or without Curry? Yeah, I mean, look, the Blazers, they're one of the nine teams that beat Golden State during the regular season, so they've done it before. Mm. And, and you know, all season long they've pretty much overachieved, excuse me, at every chance uh, that they've had, uh, every opportunity they've had. They've been counted out, and they come back, and they win. And, you know, guys like Damian Lillard and C.J. McCollum have had fantastic seasons, but – it just feels like Golden State is on another level than what Portland is on. Portland, unless they get these Herculean performances from guys like Al Farouk Aminu or Mason Plumley or Alan Crabb, I just don't see them having the firepower to go up against Golden State, even with Steph Curry 
uh, out of the lineup. And one thing that people constantly overrate or underrate, I should say, about the Warriors is is how they play defense. They're once again for the second year in a row a team that ranked in the top five in defensive efficiency. They get out and get after you on the defensive end. They might even be better defensively with Steph Curry uh, out of the lineup. So they're gonna they're gonna lock uh, Portland down, and it's gonna take, as I mentioned, some really strong performances from unexpected guys for the Blazers to get into this week, this series. Chris Maddox looking at the NBA playoffs right now. Toronto finally got out of the first round for the first time since 01. Does that make you feel better about them that they finally got past that? A little bit. Uh, I think that that first round, the, the the boogeyman of not being able to make it out of the first <laughs> round kind of weighed around their necks a little bit. I think they'll play a little bit freer now that they got out of that first round into the second round. But as always, their performance is predicated on their guards. You know, and If Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan play well, Toronto tends to win. If either one of them uh, struggles, yeah, they're a little more susceptible or a lot more susceptible uh, to losing. Now, they have uh, a series against Miami, and Miami's good, but they're not great, so I think Toronto can win this one. But you know, it, their status as a real threat to Cleveland right now is completely up in the air. Unless Lowry and DeRozan get it going and start to show more consistency in this series than they did in the last one, I, I think Toronto's a threat to beat Miami, but not a threat to compete with Cleveland. Chris, uh, I want to get your take on Frank Vogel, local guy. He's from about a half hour from here. And, uh, I mean, oh, kind of an eye-opening thing here to think that Indiana could part ways with here. I don't know that many people thought that team was going to be any good. Here they almost got out of the first round uh, of a series that no one really gave them a lot of uh, an opportunity to win. Uh, so what is Frank Vogel's future with Indiana? And if he's not in Indiana, is he in the league on a sideline next year? No, nah, I think he is going to lose his job, and it's unfortunate because I think Frank Vogel has done a fantastic job with that team over the last few years, beginning with the job he did, turning them around after taking over Jim O'Brien in midseason, developing them into a two-time Eastern Conference finalist, and then this year sort of taking a team that was trying to play a style it wasn't familiar with, uh, you know, succeeding with it on a smaller level, and then morphing it back into a big team once Miles Turner emerged as a real player uh, as a rookie, I, I I don't see how the Indiana Pacers could have been much better this year than they were under Frank Vogel with somebody else uh, at the helm. So I, I think they are going to let him go, but the future is bright for Frank Vogel. There are still some coaching jobs open, though. I'd be really wary of touching the Knicks or the Kings at this point. We don't know what's going to happen with Memphis. Dave Yeager down there uh, still, I think, could, is the possibility he could be let go. Or if Frank really wants to do something different, he might consider taking that job alongside Steve Kerr on the Golden State bench. That is a terrific job to have uh, as an assistant coach. You could step in, step in there, have some success next year, learn a few things from Steve Kerr along the way, and then be the number one coaching candidate in the summer of 2017. So whatever happens in Indiana, and hopefully it happens quickly for Frank's sake, uh, I think he's going to have a lot of options. Would be interesting if this Philadelphia job came open at some point and Frank was able to come home, maybe uh, something uh, down the road for him. We saw an assistant in Golden State on the bench head to the Lakers. What would you think of the fit for Walton in L.A.? You know, I like it. You just have to have patience with it. You know, Luke, uh, Luke Walton is not a miracle worker. He can't come in and have the same level of success with the Lakers that he did in those 40 games uh, with Golden State, not even close. Uh, but I think he's a smart coach, and I think he's an assistant on the rise. And if you give him three, maybe four years with this team, developing that young talent, hopefully adding free agents the next couple of years, there's a chance at least that the Lakers can get back to prominence. But anyone expecting, like, I don't know, a 500 record next year for the, Ra- for the Lakers, that's a pipe dream. They're going to have second-year D'Angelo Russell, basically second-year Julius Randle, probably a first-year rookie from one of those top three picks. In the Western Conference, that's not going to get you very far. But I think Luke was the right man for the job, and I think the Lakers were smart to move quickly on him. Chris Mannix with us, host of the Chris Mannix Show, weekday afternoons on NBC Sports Radio and the NBC Sports Radio app. I'll leave you uh, with Mayweather, Chris. I know the boxing world is wondering if there's a nine-figure fight for him out there. Do you see a scenario where there's a nine-figure fight for Floyd? No, I don't, and, and really I don't care because, you know, Floyd wasted the last, you know, the Mayweather, the Pacquiao fight wasn't necessarily his fault. I mean, he, he fights how he fights. You can't expect him to, you know, when he wins that big and that comfortably, don't get mad at him for doing it. But then the choice of Andre Berto at the end to walk away, a completely unqualified candidate to fight him uh, at that time. Now he'll probably, if he does come back, and I think he will, it'll probably be against Danny Garcia or somebody else that's a, you know, sort of threat but not really a threat to him. He'll get his 50th win, and he'll walk away. But mm. I have 
little to no interest in seeing Floyd fight anybody unless that person's name is Gennady Golovkin, <laughs> and that's just never going to happen. Not going to happen. Chris Maddox, everybody, senior writer, Yahoo Sports, NBA, boxing, and over at NBC Sports Radio and the NBC Sports Radio app. Chris, always a pleasure, pal. Love catching up. You got it. Anytime. Chris Maddox, everybody. NBA playoffs continue tomorrow night here on 97.3 ESPN. We've got game two of the Heat and Hawks. We'll be back with plenty more here on the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN with what you need to know for tonight.